All right. Very important for you to know. Uh, of course, Lab 2 has been released. It's not really covered by your written test number one next week, but you do definitely want to get started too. That one's going to help you for sure for many other uh, assessment in the course. But let's talk about written test number one. I can go over the test guide together with you very quickly since your first one. And number one important thing for you, you have to make sure two accounts work perfectly without any delay for you. You want to make sure you can use the easiest account to log into some Williams Small Center machine. And once you log into the machine over there, you have to use your passport, your account, and possibly the dual mobile uh, app as well to actually uh, log into the e-class. So these are two logins. You have to make sure they have no problem. All right? Otherwise, you'll be wasting time fixing it. Right? And the lab monitor might be able to help you on the test day, but you don't want to waste any time for your test. All right, guys, I cannot emphasize enough. You really have to drop by the Williams Small Center, find a gap, and log into the machine and try. If there's any issue that needs to be fixed, you better ask for help earlier. All right, let's now take a quick look at the guide that you're supposed to read. But let's read it together briefly. Okay? If you go to the lecture site, and then you will see under uh, this part over here, under the math review lecture here, you can see guide for written test number one. All right? Let's go over very quickly the critical thing that you should know. All right, that's about the timing. So you'll be given 40 minutes to complete a written test. And then you'll be next Thursday this time. We don't meet here anymore. We're going to meet over there. All right. And after the test, you're free. And I'm going to release maybe some lecture video for you to catch up. I'll make sure it's no longer than a single class. Okay. All right, you must take the uh, test in person. Please don't try to take it uh, remotely. We're going to have a sign-up sheet for you and check ID. If you try to uh, complete a test remotely, you'll just get zero, right? You want to make sure you show up. And the question will be answered by, uh, on the e-class side. That's why it's so important for you to make sure your passport, your account works. Uh, okay, I just mentioned about these two accounts and then 40 minutes and 10%, you know, just according to the syllabus. And it's not a programming test, so you don't have any starter project to, log, to really load, uh, to download and also import. Basically, just E-class. Multiple choice, mainly. And when you arrive, please just wait outside the room, 106, 108, in Williams Small Center. And then, uh, as soon as me and the TA, we are ready, we'll let you in. Okay, we'll make sure you start in time. Don't worry. And please also make sure you bring a valid photo ID. All right? And so we, uh, TA will actually have a sign-up sheet there waiting for you. You have to sign up, otherwise you'll be denied to take the test. You can bring your stationery, you can bring a sketch paper or two, as long as they're blank. Bring as many as you might need. You can bring your water bottle, you can also bring your mobile phone, mainly for the dual mobile. But once we start the test, you have to put it face down. Okay? All right, let's see. So there will be actually two tests over there for you to complete on the test day. There will be a simple quiz just about academic honesty. That one takes no more than one minute. So as soon as we let you in, you can log into the machine and complete it. And you have to complete it before you can take the actual test, which will be enabled 11.35 promptly. Okay. And uh, yeah, uh, the format, mostly multiple choice. But there might be some question requiring you to fill out the blanks, in which case you may have to write, for example, valid rodent syntax that you have to make sure you get prepared. Right? That's something we expect from you uh, in lab number one. All right, about the coverage, you can read it through. But basically, you have to study the math review lecture and also about the uh, lab number one. As for the bridge controller and also your lab tube, they will not be covered. I will not ask you any questions related to them, so you don't need to worry. But I would suggest you still keep up the pace with the lecture. And I will definitely make some example question to you uh, by the end of tomorrow, hopefully just earlier. Right? If not today, definitely tomorrow, so you can uh, take a look. All right? Question. Yeah, as I said, no, nothing about bridge controller, nothing. Yeah, just math review at lab one, the bank, yes. Of course, I might give you something similar to the bank, maybe just different name of the system. Okay. All right, guys, do you have any confusion about how the test should be run? Feel free to ask, I can clarify. Yes. Sorry. My bad, go ahead. Doesn't matter.
doesn't no matter which room you go. So I would say you can start going uh, to 106. We filled it, uh, filled it out, and then 108. Yeah. Yeah, there's no seating plan. You can sit any way you like. All right. If no question about a written test one yet, then I'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, sorry, next Thursday for the test. But we still got lecture today and also Tuesday. Okay. All right. If no question here, then let's now resume our contents for bridge controller. All right. This is what where we left off from last time. We'll talk about how you can specify the state space for the initial model M0. And let me do a very quick recap about what we learned last time, and then I'll continue talking about invariance and how we can formulate the proof of invariance. That's going to be the very critical part for the course. Okay. Right. If you recall, for initial model, we are only trying to address requirement number two, which is about the number of cards that will be on the bridge and the island. So we don't really have any distinct uh, distinction between the bridge and the island. So they are a single compound. And it's really important to remember we have a single variable n over here, right? That's a variable. And constant and axiom here, that's really corresponding to the context of your rodent platform, right? And also the variables and invariants, so this part here is about the machine. Of course, we said this is static and this is dynamic, right? And let's uh, take a quick look. We're saying that we have a constant d, which is about the limits on the number of cars that's in the island and the bridge. And it should be a natural number. It can be zero, can be one, can be two, and so on. And we're saying that the number of cars in the island and bridge is going to be denoted by n. So it's a variable, so you can go from zero to one, one to two, two back to one, and et cetera. Right? And the way you can expect a variable value to change always is by the occurrence of events over here. I'll talk about these two events uh, in more details in just a moment. Occurrences of events usually change values of variable in general. Could be multiple variables. Okay? And here we got two events called ML out and ML in. I'll talk about these two events in just a bit. And what I want to talk about is some very important bullet point from your slides. Let me talk about it first. So we say invariance should be established and preserved. So what do I mean by this? Let's clarify the concept very quickly. Okay, so let me just open a new blank page and let's talk about invariance. So when we talk about the invariance, it's a Boolean uh, expression. You may have multiple conditions. That's why I'm using plural over here. Right? It's uh, some conditions that must hold true all the time. And let's now be pre more precise about what do I mean all the time. There are two cases you want to consider. And I want you to tell you right away, you may want to link what I'm, what I'm going to talk about for invariance to mathematical induction. Right? You know, back in your math course, when, you, when we talk about mathematical induction, you have to worry about base cases, you know, small cases, and also inductive cases. Right? Let's talk about these two cases. Case number one. Let me call invariant just I. That's the very common symbol we use to say it's a predicate called I. Okay. I should be established. After initializing the system, for example, in your lab number one, when we, how do we initialize a bank? We just assign the account uh, relation to be just empty empty relation. That's one way to initialize the system. And the way to visualize this is like this. Think about we have some, so circle means the states. Okay, so this is like an initial states. And then usually we just say an arrow put it here. So that's the one single states that's going to be a result of the initialization. 
All right? And we're going to see more example in the bridge controller. And we're saying that this one here should satisfy I. Evaluating I on the initial states should give you true. Should be true. All right? Let me just say it should be green. All right? That one should be proved somehow. And what about case number two? Case number two, slightly more complicated, but it's not too bad. Case number two is for every event, for every event, if it is enabled. All right, I'll talk about each one of them. That assuming that the invariant i is true, then i remains or well, preserve. Let me use the word preserve. That's what's used in your in slides. i is preserved to be true. After Let's say for every event E. In the case of bridge controller, you got two events for initial model, ML, MLN. But here I just talk about E. After actions of the E take place, take events. And I'll visualize that in just a moment. But let me just highlight a keyword for you. So we got events and we got invariant I. Also, we got actions, and also we got something called enabled. All right, so these are all important concepts over here. And let me visualize that first. This is what it is trying to say. Given any arbitrary states, so these are arbitrary states, let's call that SI. So I here just an index, right? Just any arbitrary states. And in this particular state here, there are two things we are considering. Number one, the guard of E is true. Number two, assume invariant I is true. Think about these two are more like antecedents before we can do a proof. All right? And then we're saying that if you try to execute the actions of the event E, Okay, here is action. Then the resulting states over here should be provably true for the invariance. Okay. SI plus one. Think about we go from SI to a, uh, SI plus one by executing the action of the uh, events E here. And it is so important here, I'll put it here. It should be, oh, let me use a different color just to show you. It should be provable that invariant I remains true. All right, let me explain again. If you actually somehow want to argue that the invariant property is actually true for your model, for your system, there are two things you have to consider. Number one, you want to make sure once you launch the system to be initialized, that invariant must be true. This usually is typic, uh, very easy to prove, just the base case. The recursive case or the inductive cases was slightly more complicated. That's why we need to really formulate the proof obligation, which we'll try to do either today or possibly most likely maybe next, uh, next Tuesday. Okay? So let's uh, think about what's happening here. Assuming that this particular state, the starting states, arbitrary states, where the guard of E, the event that we're talking about, is actually true. That means the event is enabled. That means we can take the events. That means it is enabled. It is enabled, and also the I invariant assumed to be true. That we should be able to prove that invariant remain to be true. 
over here. If you want an example right away, let's say this. Remember in your lab number one, okay? Let's say, for example, lab number one. Okay? So let's say, for example, if I have some stay here, and also I have some stay over here, and somehow I want to do, do a withdrawal. Okay. In order for the withdrawal to take place, number one, the, uh, one of the invariants must be uh, true. And also the guard of the withdrawal event should be true as well. Okay, let's, uh, I'll take just one, one of the invariants. Okay, so let's say the accounts. I'll write a little bit more informally. Accounts balance is larger than or equal to minus C. Remember that credit limit, right? It should be larger than or equal to minus C, okay? And also that's uh, about enableness of the events. And number two, also uh, the V, the, um, the amount that we want to withdraw is larger than or equal to zero, something like that, okay? Assuming that these two conditions are actually true, we want to somehow prove that after taking the withdrawal, the withdrawal itself, if you recall the action, the action is going to decrement the balance by V. We want to make sure in this resulting states, accounts balance remains larger than or equal to minus C, okay? Still a little bit not a precise sketch, but I think that's good for now. And once we get to the formal uh, proof obligation, I think it makes even more sense. But for now, just remember, you have to consider invariant preservation, the second case, for every event that's in your system. We're gonna do MLL and MLN for the consideration. And we have to show that for every possible state where the event is enabled, if the event really takes place, the resulting state is guaranteed to really show, uh, is guaranteed to maintain the invariance to be true as well. That's the critical uh, insight. All right, any question about this? Okay, yes, go ahead. Uh, oh, you mean here? Uh, remains. It remains to be larger than or equal to minus C. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's now move on a bit. Okay, so this is, uh, let's continue from here. All right, so we already talked about establishing and also maintaining variance, and let's now talk about events. And then we're gonna do some fun exercise to see how we can informally judge if the model is actually correct, okay? And let's have some definition here. Based on the state space, you know, with the static part and dynamic part, we can somehow visualize the system as an abstract state machine. We can draw that. I'll show you how to draw it. And the system is going to keep evolving as the actions of the enabled events can take place. And you can actually go to different states. That's something we'll see. And we talk about an event being enabled versus being disabled. If there's any, uh, in this case, let's say, you can see for ML out and also ML in. So these are the only two events that we have to consider for this initial model here and over here. As, as we said last time, there is no guard. It would be as if we had the when, and then here we simply say true. And here also we got when, true. That means these two events are always enabled. As a design principle, you really don't want some event to be always enabled. There should be some constraint, usually. All right. And we're gonna see how problematic this might be in a moment, okay? All right, so we'll talk about enable and disable. And then, once, uh, if the event is enabled, that means the, the action can take place. And we want to make sure the resulting states by taking the action will still satisfy the invariance. Okay? We're gonna do example. 
All right, let's now try. So let's try with ML out. Informally, is ML out really designed correctly? So you want to ask yourself the following question. Is it possible to really take ML out, maybe for multiple times, in such a way that the resulting states is going to violate the invariance? Let's bring a little bit more con concrete about the context here. The only two invariants we worry about are these two. These two invariants should always hold. And let's ask the first question. Is ML out going to maintain that's an invariant I. Always. That's a very critical question. Even before I draw the diagram, do you guys think there might be a way to let ML being taken for a few times and then it's going to violate invariance? Is there any way? Give you a little bit of hints. Let's say we can only have up to two cars in the island and the bridge. Is it possible to actually violate the invariance simply because ML out is always enabled? Is it possible? Right? Yeah. Because each time when you try to do ML out, there's going to be one car added in. Taking another car, another car. We're already made, uh, reaching the maximum. If you take another one, because there's no restriction, right? We can get another one. And in this case, three less than or equal to two is false. Right? It's a very informal sketch. Let's now put a little bit more diagrammatic. Let me try this one here. Let's say we have some, oh, sorry. Let me do a little bit better. This one here. Let's say this. Let's say we have the constant d to be two. Just make it simple. Initially, let's say n will be just zero. We only got zero cars. No car has been to the bridge or to the island yet, right? So that's the uh, initial states. And then let's say we try ML out one time. Oh, number one, in this particular states, is ML out enabled? Yes. Well, in this case, it's actually pretty trivial because ML out is always enabled. It's simply true. You can think about evaluating true on any arbitrary state is going to be true anyway. But we're going to see a little bit more uh, different cases later if that's stronger than true. All right, so let me make a note for you. In this state, ML out is enabled. So let's take it one time. ML out. And then I'm going to paste it over here. So after this, it's going to increment the value by one, right? So n will go from zero to one. Now, initially, do you agree? This initial states does satisfy the invariance, both of them, right? Because you can see here, zero over here is a natural number. Zero less than or equal to two is also true. So the invariant is definitely satisfied initially. After taking one single transition by ML's action, are we maintaining the invariance over here? Yeah. We are, because one here, natural number, one less than equal to two, so we are fine. So let me also color that as green. So we haven't really got to a uh, violating state just yet. Let's do another one. This one here, because the ML out is still enabled. So ML out. So here is going to be from one to two. And is this state violating the invariance? It's not. it's not, not yet, not yet. Because again, two is a natural number. Two less than or equal to two is also true. So we're still fine. Okay, let's do one more. And in this particular state, if we try to evaluate the guard for ML out, it's still true. It is still enabled. So we can do one more. Now, if we take another ML out, 
we will get into trouble because that one there is going to increment the value from 2 to 3. Now we got trouble because you can see here, 3 is a natural number. That's fine. But 3 less than or equal to 2 is not good. So, so invariant here is not satisfied. Not the case. All right? So this is definitely considered as a problematic state. As long as the event itself being enabled can result in some states violating the invariance, there's something wrong with this design. In general, it could be something wrong with the action, or it could be something wrong with the guard. But we're going to argue that it's something about the guard. We'll see how to identify this formally. And why is this important? Let me go a little bit deeper. We say that this particular system trace can lead to a state violating the invariance. Let me write it down. Think about this arrow over here is the init, initialization, right? Remember in the bank, you also got initialization. So we say that this particular trace, we got init, and also we got ML out, we got ML out, and also we got ML out. So this is said to be a trace. So this is said to be a trace leading to invariant violation. All right. That's really something I want to show to you. And you ought to be able to somehow come up, come up with the trace yourself sometimes. All right. And I'll let you guys do maybe exercise for MLN. We just showed that informally ML out is problematic because it can lead to some invariant violation. What about MLN? Is it possible for that to lead to invariant violation? How? Uh huh. So what will be the error trace? What will be the trace leading to it? Okay, awesome. So guys, that's exactly the point. Let me draw it down. Okay, put it down. If you think about it, let's say this. Now, I'll put it here. That one is much shorter. So let's say we got another trace to show to you. Let's say here, initially, right, that's an init. And then, let's say this, is this state going to enable MLN? Indeed, because its guard is simply just true. And this one here is actually not problematic because this one still satisfies the variance. But if we try to take one time, one occurrence of MLN, according to its action, it's going to decrement the variable value by one. That way, we're going to get to, over here, from zero down to minus one. Right? Apparently, you can see minus one being a natural number is already false, right? So that's violating the invariance. So that's why this is considered as a problematic state. I'll make a little bit more notes for you. You can think about minus one here is not a member of the natural number. So it's why it's violating it. And the problematic trace to put it would be, okay, let me just go a little bit to the top over here. After the initialization, if you take just one occurrence of MLN, this one here can lead to invariant violation. All right? That's what we are showing here. So informally, we just showed you the initial model that we talked about last time by including MLN and ML out. They are problematic in their design because they can lead to invariant violation. We might have other concerns later, like a deadlock freedom. But for now, let's focus on only invariance. Okay, but this is just informal. What we need to do is to see how we can prove this formally. That's something we have to build you up for the mathematical scaffolding for you to do it. All right. Any question up to now? So what, what should you learn from this discussion over here? If I simply give you the state space, like a all the constant, axiom, variable, invariance, and then I might give you some design for the events. If I didn't really ask you to formally prove that the invariance preserved, I just ask you, is there anything wrong with the events? 
So a very quick way for you to try is to see if you, come, you can come up with any error trace, either like this or like this, to show that it is possible. By taking the events, you can lead to some invariant violation. This is still informal. Okay. All right, if no questions, then I'll move on. That's about ML out and that's ML in. Okay. Oh, another thing that's also very important to mention here. Uh, you know what, I'll do that maybe a little bit later. That one might be too much for now. All right, now let's dive deeper. So now we are going to, oh, Adnan, go ahead. Of course, you mean the iPad or the slides? Over here. ML, oh, yeah, we just talked about, oh, awesome. Yes, absolutely. And then spot on. So I think uh, this ML out should really have this trace. ML in should have this trace. I'll make sure I fix that. Thank you. Very good. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll make sure I fix that so you guys have no confusion. But the big picture should still be clear. All right. Now we're going to talk about something you might be a little bit confused back in lab number one about actions and also before after predicates. It's really important as we build a formulation, you will need that. Okay, let's now, let's go over some bullet points and then I'll clarify. And if the events are evaluated true, that means the event is enabled to take place. And we have to talk about something called before states or pre-states and something called after or post states. So these are two important notions before we can build things further. All right. Let's now switch and then I will give you some visualization quickly. Here, you know what? I'll just put it here just in case. Okay. Right, you got the ML out, you got the ML in. And let's first of all, just to clarify, what you have over here and what you have over here is what you type in Rodent. So these are called actions. And in order for you to really conduct any proof about your model, you cannot simply just use the call and equal directly. That's not gonna fit into mathematical framework. You have to somehow translate them into the corresponding so-called before after predicate. So that's something I need to explain. But this translation is pretty straightforward, but you really ought to know the insight behind the scene, all right? In general, we have, again, let me draw the states. Let's say we have some states over here, and also we have some states over here. Okay, and then we want to really take a transition by some events. E, all right, some event E. That is enabled. <coughs> Think about before the action is executed versus the state after the action is executed. That's really the idea between pre-state and post-states. We call this the pre-states. And we call this over here the post states. Very quick example. Let's say for ML out, the pre state value could be n is equal to 2. The post state value could be n is equal to 3. It's being incremented, pre state and post states. Very often you have to know the relationship between the pre and post states as a predicate. That's why you had to specify. Okay? All right, and then, uh, oh, there's another name I can also mention. And the before and after. So pre-state, you can also call that a before states. The same. And also here, it's called the after states. All right. And there is some syntax you also should know about how to express the actions over here as predicate, okay? For the post states over here, variables are primed. So what do I mean by that? 
Okay? Think about if you want to talk about these two states together, so this is n equal to 2, this n here is really the post state value. So the more accurate way of saying this is to say n prime. Notice that n here and n prime over here, we are talking about the same variable. But this n here is talking about the value of n before the event takes place. The n prime over here is talking about the same variable, but its value after the action of the events takes place. And if you try to express the relationship between these two, what would you have? Okay, if you look at these two over here, you can obviously see m prime is equal to m plus 2. Oh, sorry, m plus 1. Okay. It's simple notation, but I just ought to know what we are talking about over here. And this part over here is really the so-called before-after predicates. Which characterize characterizing the effects of the events. So this is why for this one over here we say that n is going to become okay, another one. How should you in interpret this symbol over here? I would suggest you try to interpret it as something called becomes. We are saying that after ML out takes place, the value of n in the post states becomes the value of n in the pre-state plus 1. Okay, let me write it down here. After ML out, action takes effects. The post state value of n becomes the pre state value of n plus 1. So it's a little bit long, but it's really no way around to really explain it. Let me say that again. This one here is really talking about the post state value on the left hand side. And this one over here is really talking about the nth value in the pre states. Right? And this will be the corresponding before after predicates, which is n prime equals n plus 1, which I also explained to you over here. All right? Guys, any questions so far? Is it kind of clear? I hope. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, let me clarify one, more th uh, one thing right away. The way, to ex uh, uh, the way to understand this notation here, I would suggest don't understand it as a variable assignment. That's not the right way. I'll tell you why. When you specify event actions, when you say variable v, and then you say v plus 1, for example, okay? number one, you should really understand as becomes. The post state value of v should become the pre state value of v plus 1. Don't understand it as programming assignments. Not variable assignments. And I'll give you one example. Hopefully that will convince you. Let's, let's consider the following events. I'll just call it EVT. Okay? And then we have some action over here between the begin and the end. All right, over here. Okay? Let's say if I got x becomes x plus 1. And let's say x, x minus 1. Let me write this down first. 
What do you think this might mean over here? What will be the effects of taking this transition of the events? Is it going to change the value of x at all or something else? It seems like it's not going to change the value, right? I'm going to increment and then decrement. If you're thinking that way, that's wrong, totally wrong. Okay. First of all, what this really means is like this. Remember the before after predicate we talked about, right? X and X over here are referring to the post state value for the same variable. So we are saying X prime equals X plus one. Also we say X prime equals X minus one because it's predicate. When you put two actions over here together, it's as if both must be true at the same time. And what is this equivalent to? False. How can x be equal to this value and this value at the same time? Because x plus y and x minus y are definitely different value. How can the same post state value equal to both at the same time? So this is simply equivalent to false. So what's my point here? My point is the way to understand this colon equal here, think about it's more like a specifying a predicate. You're saying that the post state value after the transition of the events must become this value over here. And if you got multiple actions over here as the body of the events, in that case, all the predicates should be true at the same time. So that's why in Roden, if you try to write this, it's going to tell you something like the following. You cannot put the same left hand side multiple times. I'm pretty sure you ran into that trouble before. So this is why. All right. Cannot have the same variable as the left hand side multiple times. All right. That kind of answer your question, right? I hope. Yes. So guys, this is really simple, but it's really important. The main point is don't understand the call it equal here as a variable assignment. It's simply not. All right. Exercise for you. I'll put it here. And we can solve it right away. Oh, sorry. How about just that? Let's say I have an event called swap. I want to swap, let's say, variable x and variable y. How do I specify the action over here? First of all, let me tell you what's wrong. Okay? You might be thinking, assuming that we got x, y, and temp. I'll just make it convenient for you. You might be thinking, maybe I'm going to say temp equals x, and then uh, y equals temp, and x equals y. Right? That's a typical way you actually do the uh, swap. Something like that, right? I believe. Ten equal to x, yeah, y will be, yep. x equals y. Something like that. Is that the right way to do it? Sequential. No, not anymore. It's actually much simpler than you might think how we can do a swap. Any suggestion? First of all, this is not right. Because colon equal is not variable assignments. What should be the correct answer? Exactly. That's right. So that, let me write it down. The correct answer should be just x equals y, y equals x, calling equal. If you're considering this as variable assignment, that wouldn't make sense because you don't have that intermediate variable. But now we're doing specification. We're not doing programming. So that's why this is the right specification. And this one here simply correspond to the following before after predicate, which is x prime equals y and y prime equals x. And let me make it even more explicit for you. How do you understand this part over here? Think about in the pre-states and also in the post-states over here. 
and we are making some transition of the swap. In the pre-states, we simply got x value and y value, right? And then in the post-states, we got x prime and y prime. And over here, we are saying x prime should just be the y. And y prime should just be the x. That's what we're saying for the swap, all right? So, so far, it's really important for you to understand call and equal is not assignments. It's simply like a becomes. And all the predicates should be satisfied simultaneously, not sequentially. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that idea is uh, carried to you clearly. All right. So that's about before after predicate. Let me see if I uh, miss anything here. Okay. Very good. And the last bullet point is actually why we're doing this. Later on, we're going to see how we can express proof obligations. And for that one, we just need to use uh, before after predicate. Think about proof obligation here is like a Boolean condition that must be provable. And we're going to use something called sequent calculus to really express it. We'll get there very soon. Okay, so, okay, I think, okay, that's good. So guys, how about this? Why don't we take a short break and take attendance and then we'll continue, All right? It's now time to do to, to a little pause. Okay, let me just start it. Yeah, bear with me. It should be launched very soon. There we go. All right, you can check in, please. Yeah, if you got any trouble, please just come forward. I got a sign-up sheet for you. Just come to the front, please. Everyone's okay without any uh, difficulty for this? Okay. Yeah, if you got any trouble, please come forward. There's a sign-up sheet here. Otherwise, I will resume in two minutes. You guys in trouble? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have a pen? I do not have a pen. Uh, I just missed it. Okay. Yeah, see if you can uh, maybe bring the pen. Yeah, get a pen, please. All right. I just missed the attendance. Oh, missed the attendance. Okay. Do I just have it? Do you have a pen? No. Oh, yeah, sure. Where? Uh, right now. I, I think you should swap these two lines. Yeah, exactly. I know that's not exactly right. Don't worry, I'll fix it when I post the notes. Yeah, I know what you mean. Just take mark over here? Uh, yeah, check mark and sign. Yeah. Thank you. You can uh, find your name and then put a check mark and then sign. Awesome. All right, we'll resume, resume one minute, please.
All right, we'll resume in just one moment, please. All right, let's resume, please. All right, we're going to talk about the sequence calculus very soon. We can get there today. Very good. But before that, I'd like to make just one more emphasis about invariant preservation. We can formulate, the, formulate that a little bit using the universal quantification, just make it even clearer for you. All right. So invariant preservation. So given what we have got so far, we want to make sure for every possible states from your state space. In this case, what will be the state space? It depends on what the variable is. We only got n. We want to make sure for every possible value of n, we cannot really run into invariant violation. All right. So let me just formulate it very quickly, and then we can move on to sequent. Okay. Again, that's our model here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Think about collectively, we got two invariants. That's i. Okay. And this part here is our state space, just one variable. Right? So these are two possible updates we may actually uh, use to really change the value of the state space, either by this or by that. And this is some universal quantification you can keep in mind. That's really about what should be done, uh, what should be always true. So we can say for every state S, we can say states. And then we can say the states a member of the state space. This is uh, more general. But you can think about in our case, you can think about for every n, such that what's the type of n? It's simply a natural number. All right. And then if that's the case, we want to make sure the invariance is satisfied on the states. In our case, we want to make sure n is less than or equal to d. All right. Now, just a little exercise here. Remember back in the math review lecture, we said you can easily convert between universal and existential. Right? Over here, we're saying that for every possible state that's allowed by the state space, the invariant must hold true. What would be the other way to interpret this condition here using existential? Right? Let me just apply faithfully the conversion. Not the case, there exist a states. And then the state should still be allowed by the state space and not the case. And think about how we interpret this. This will be actually even more useful. We're saying that there does not exist any states. That's in the state space. And the state actually violates the invariance. If there's such a state, then that means your model is problematic. So think about this one here. We want, whenever you want to uh, show that your model is problematic, this is what you have to show. This is like a witness of violation. Before the break, we actually saw two witnesses of this. I'll show you right away. This is witness number one. This is the one state where it violates the invariance. This one here is witness number two, which violates also the invariance. Right? All right. Any question about the formulation here? Every state that's possible from your system model must satisfy the invariance. If you can find one single state that does not satisfy the invariance, that means your model is problematic. How do you uh, find a witness? You can show us a uh, trace that lead to invariant violation. All right, any question before I move on to uh, sequence? Go ahead. Uh, 
I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, because typically this one is a little bit special case. I would say somehow this invariant here is more like a typing constraint. Well, you know what? I can do a little bit better. How about this? Let me do a little bit better. I, I, I'm glad you asked. So n here, before we talk about the invariance, n here is simply some integer. Why don't we say n is actually an integer? And then it should be n is a natural number, and also it should be less than or equal to d. So this part over here definitely is the two invariants you have. And here, just you have to give some typing constraint about the n. Let's give it the most generous one, which is an integer. Okay. I hope that makes more sense for you. Okay, good. All right, guys, sequent. Let's make sure we clarify the syntax and hopefully the meaning about sequence, and we will be able to play more with the sequence next time. All right, sequence. Let me see. And what will be the syntax for sequence? Over here. Let me see. Does any okay? That's the syntax. All right. Either you can write it horizontally, or you can write it vertically. Depends on which one might be more convenient, right? So that will be the syntax. It has to stay in your mind throughout the course. All right. We're gonna. You have to do a sequence proof a lot manually on the paper. All right. Let's now uh, talk about the different parts of the sequence. Okay. Number one, have you guys seen this symbol before? Do you know what this symbol is called? Turnstile. And do you know the historical reason for turnstile? Do you know why? Just for what it's worth. Okay. I got something here. Have you guys ever passed a gate like this in subway? It's called turnstile. It look, doesn't this look like the symbol? Kind of. That's, that's why it's called turnstile. I'm not making that up. It's actually true. That's the old style for the turnstile in the subway station. I think we're lucky enough. We are still see, seeing this in TTC. But anyway, turnstile. All right. All right, this one is called turnstile. All right. And then you can think about H either to the left or H above, right? Let's clarify the terminology first. For H over here, H over here, okay. Let me try to go over the bullet point as, as I go uh, annotation, okay. Okay, turn style, I just talked about it. And H is a set of predicates. It's called hypothesis or assumption, okay. So the H over here is called assumptions or hypothesis. What about G? Oh, sorry, keep forgetting. And G is also another set of predicates. That means multiple. And it's called goal or conclusion. The G here is called a go or the conclusion. Okay, that's the syntax. And each one of them will be a set of predicates. Both the H here and the G here are sets of predicates may not be a single one. That's basically what it means, especially for the hypothesis. Usually it will be more than one for you to assume to be true. And the go is more often the case is a single one, just happen to be a singleton set. That's what you will see. But in general, it can be a set. And that's about the syntax, okay? What about the meaning, the semantics, okay? Informally, let's see what the slide says. We say that H turnstile G itself is a predicate, first of all, okay? When I write H turnstile G, this one here can either be true or it could be false. So you ought to know what does it really mean when it's actually true? What does it really mean when it's uh, false, okay? 
the formal meaning goes like this. If and only if, right? Very simple. H implies G. And I'm pretty sure you're familiar with implication that we did in the review. Informally, this is what it means. Assuming all the hypotheses, the goal should be provable. If, <coughs> excuse me, if it is provable, the whole sequence is going to be true. If it is not provable, then it's going to be false. All right. So true means the G is provable given H. And the F over here is saying the other way. Okay? That means G is not provable. Even though you were given H. All right? But just remember, formally, it really boils down into an imprecation. That's the critical part. But you should also know the informal meaning over here. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sometimes people say H, the hypothesis entails G. Well, H yields G. Yeah, just different way of saying it. And true and false, different cases. And now, uh, okay, that's what I just mentioned, right? It's an imprecation. Given a hypothesis, we want to show that G is provable, okay? And now we want to ask you a simple question, okay? When I say the H part, remember it's a set of predicates. What if the set of predicates is actually empty? What does it really mean? Okay, I'll put it here. It is possible for you to see something like this. You might see turnstile, some go over here. That's one possibility. Or the turnstile over here, nothing here, but you got a G over here. Okay? Now, so here we call the empty hypothesis, right? That's what I meant. Empty or absent. Okay? What does it really mean logically? Does it really mean the hypothesis can be true or false? I'll give you two choices. Should it be true or should it be false? Should it be true? Why, why shouldn't it be false? There's nothing to? There's nothing to prove otherwise. Mm, you're getting there, but not quite. What does it really mean? Well, okay, let's say this. Hypothetically, if I say this, oh, we are wondering. If that would just be equivalent to false entails G. Right? Let's apply the formal definition. Implies, right? We know that this is equivalent to false implies G. Right? And do you remember one of the proposition, propositional axiom or theorem that we talked about before? It's something called the zero of imprecation. Anything implies, uh, false implies anything, right? And this is simply equivalent to just true. So that is saying, if you simply leave the hypothesis empty, you're not assuming anything, and you can end up proving anything. That's not right. So that's why having this absolute should not be equivalent to false. Guys, let me say that again, all right? So the question was, What's really the logical uh, explanation for the hypothesis being absent? And we are saying that treating the uh, absent hypothesis as simply false is not appropriate. Because if we got false as the hypothesis, that means false implies anything. So that means it can prove anything. So that's not appropriate. All right? So this is not appropriate. All right, instead, what we should have is something like this. So, should be equivalent to true entails G. 
And if you remember, there's another propositional theorem. It's called identity of implication, right? So this one here is equivalent to simply true implies G. And that is simply equivalent to just G. So what does that mean? If I don't have the hypothesis over here, it simply means I have to prove the goal directly without any help from, uh, of any additional hypothesis. Right? So that's the right interpretation. All right, so this is equivalent to this. Hopefully it's not too heavy, right? Okay. Well, let's see if there's anything else I need to say. Yeah. Yeah, why not? It's false, which I just explained. All right. All right, let's now try to see if I miss anything. Give me a moment. Oh, let me just make sure. Okay, good. Let's now move on. And why is this important for the sequent? Later on, once we get to maybe next uh, Tuesday, we're going to see using this particular syntax, using the turnstile, we can formulate all the necessary proof obligations in your system model by using a sequence. And the sequence itself is a predicate which you must prove true. And how do we prove it? We have to use something called sequence calculus using various inference rules. That's something we'll get into. But this is just the basic. You want to at least understand what's going on over here. All right? Okay, got about 10 minutes or so. We can do a little bit more. All right? Then let's now talk about invariant preservation. We are now moving towards uh, formulating the uh, invariant preservation proof obligation as a sequence. That's something we can do. Let's do a little bit of preparation. Okay. This is the informal sketch about what should be the case. Right? Let's read it together. Okay. Based on what I just showed to you about the syntax and meaning. Okay, let's try to see. Okay, and then I think this will be good enough to last us until the end for today. Can you guys simply try to take a look of this? Okay, and there's a turn style over here. Apparently, since we got so many things, a set of predicates as the hypothesis. So in this case, it may not be so easy to write the turn style uh, over here. So that's why we're putting that over here. But it doesn't matter. Okay, it's there. Just one moment, and then. Try to see if you can interpret that just informally. What are we trying to say there over there? And if you'd like to give it a try, just raise your hand. And then just give you some informal interpretation. Ryan, go ahead. That's pretty much spot on. I like that. Very good. Yep. I think what Ryan said is basically right. I'll just add a little bit more details to, to elaborate. Given this, we can show that this is provable, number one. Right? That's a big picture about how to interpret a turnstile a sequence. Okay? Let's analyze this very carefully because we'll need this uh, to do some formal proof. Okay, this part here is somehow we assume to be true. And this part over here is something that we should really show is provable. Should be provable. And the whole sequence over here can either be true or false, right? Remember, right? Your sequence itself is a predicate. And the whole sequence is going to be true if this turns out to be provable. And the sequence will be false if this cannot be provable. That's according to the definition that we spoke about earlier. Right? We're just using what we learned just a few minutes ago. All right? And let's dive a little bit deeper into these. And then we'll try to make it more formal next time. But for now, let's try to uh, understand what's going on. Let's start with something simple. Here you see axiom. Axiom is really referring to this one here. 
Okay, let's try to prove some sequence at the same time. So this one here is the axiom. So we got D is a member of this. Okay, only one axiom. And then we got something here. It's called invariance satisfied at the pre-states. Okay, invariant one and invariant two. Both of them should be satisfied in the pre-states. So let's write it down. Remember the pre-state value should be unprimed. So what I will do is I'm going to put n here and n here. So n is a natural number. And also n should be less than or equal to d. Okay? Here is a guards of the event. So this one tells you how this sequence should look like depends on which event you're considering. How many possible events can we consider for this model? Either this or this. Let's say we are not considering M out. Let's say, all right? Let's say we are not considering M out. I'll put it aside. So the guards of the events is going to be the guard of M out. In this case, it would be true. Let me write down true explicitly. All right? And then we got the turnstile. Are we okay so far? All right, and what about this guy here? Invariance satisfied at the post states. So now we gotta consider the same two invariants, but with a little bit different angle. This invariant over here, and this invariant over here. The green one is about the invariant to be evaluated at their pre-states. And now for the post states, what should we do? We prime them, all right? And for these two, I'm going to talk about M prime and N prime less than or equal to D. We're getting very close. So guys, quick, quick question for you. Is it possible for me to simplify this M prime over here? Wouldn't it be nice if we can have just N rather than M prime. Is there a way for me to simplify this? You got question or you got answer? Uh, can, can you simplify it to N plus one? Hmm? Can you simplify it? You mean uh, these two? Simplify to N plus one? Yeah. Why? Why, can, why can I do that? Yes. And also we're considering M out, so that's what you're referring to. Very good. Thank you. All right, guys, let me say it again, okay? Right now, we are considering ML out, okay? So if we look at the action part for ML out, this is the action, and it's corresponding before, after predicate, looks like this. Before, after predicate is M prime equals M plus one, if you remember, right? So that means if I'm talking about a post-state value, that can be replaced by m plus one, the pre-state value plus one, right? That's what we talk about. And here, I can simply replace this by m plus one, and also m plus one over here. This is more or less the sequence we will have to prove. For now, we don't really have the inference rule just yet, but for now, stating the sequence is an important first step, okay? Let me say one more thing, and then I'll take maybe your question. What we have done so far is, based on this informal sketch, we have to make sure we choose an event to, for consideration, and the one out, okay? So that's why we can replace the guards of the events over here by over here will be replaced before after predicate for that events. Okay, let's do some quick exercise. What should be the corresponding sequence for MLN? Are they gonna look similar or completely different? Kind of similar, right? Okay. Tell me which part should be the same, which part should be different? Which part should be the same, first of all? Axiom should be the same, right? Doesn't matter which event we're talking about, it will be the same axiom. The invariant satisfied at the pre-state should be the same as well. But the part over here will be different. In general, 
because every event, uh, each event might have a different guard. And also here, invariants satisfy the post states. Now for m prime, we may have to re replace them by different before after predicate because of different events, right? I mean, uh, write it down. So what we have is, we still got the event, uh, axiom the same. And also we got invariants in the pre-states, which would be n natural number n less than or equal to d. And let's say we are now considering MLN. Right? It's a different event that we're considering, MLN. Okay? And then we're going to put, oh, they happen to be the same guard. Okay? It's also true for, for the guard. And let's put the uh, turnstile over here. And the invariants in the post states, let's start with something that is uh, easier to understand. It's going to be m prime, a natural number, and also m prime less than or equal to d. Now, how do we simplify m prime with respect to MLN? n minus 1, right? That's what you're thinking, right? Very good, because you can see this before after predicate here is different. All right, I'll write it down here. So the before after predicate for this event over here is m prime is equal to n minus 1. So this one here will be n minus 1, n minus 1. So these are the two sequence we will have to prove somehow for invariant preservation. There's some little detail I haven't really mentioned, but that's okay for now. All right, guys, let me recap very quickly and I'll let you go, okay? Before next class, we can dive even deeper into formulating a sequence and try to see how we can prove it. So you want to make sure, number one, you understand about invariant preservation, the idea, how you can come up with a wit uh, witness traces to prove otherwise, and also the syntax, and also the meaning for the uh, turnstile, the sequence. I can tell you that things will get a little bit confusing next time because I need to talk about something called inference rule. And the inference rule actually got very similar syntax for this, but in the, ter the interpretation is not exactly the same. Right? So that's why you really want to be clear about what this is. And then try to also understand why, based on this particular rule over here about invariant preservation, we can actually come up with two different sequence over here to be proved. And we're going to discharge one by one later. Yeah, things will get a little bit more ugly from now on. So just get, uh, make sure you ask questions as you get any confusion, all right? All right, thank you so much. I'll see you guys next Tuesday.